All right, good afternoon, everyone. Continue to answer those polls. I'll leave them up here for a minute uh, longer. Um, welcome to the learning tree. Uh, GUIs for Python, a brief overview webinar presented to you today by Learning Tree author and instructor Mike Covington. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. I am the I am Darby Jago, I'm one of the product managers here at Learning Tree. So before we start, I do want to take a quick moment to introduce you to the Learning Tree Anywhere platform. Uh, if you have ever participated in a Learning Tree class as a live virtual attendee, you will recognize this layout as this is what we use in in our learning tree courses. So you'll see that our presenter Mike is in the upper left hand corner of your screen. Below Mike is our chat box. Um, this is where you can participate with questions or comments. Feel free to say good afternoon and where you're from if you'd like to test it out there. Um, and then in the top middle, you'll see the, the presentation. Um, and below that right now are those poll questions that I had mentioned. So um, please continue to answer those if you have a chance. So as I mentioned, you can see our presenter, Mike Covington in the upper left-hand corner there. Uh, Mike is a learning tree author, instructor, technical editor, Editor, a consultant. Uh, he wears very many, very many hats, <laughs> um, teaching well over 600 classes and training over 20,000 professionals since 1998. You are a busy man, Mike. So I'm going to go ahead and allow you to get started here and um, I'll chat with you at the end. Well, welcome aboard, everybody. Uh, good to have you uh, with us and uh, so let's get started. What we hope to do in the next 45 minutes or so is discuss adding a GUI to a Python project. In the case at hand, we're going to talk about projects that are already written and designed for the console. And we'll see how to create an appropriate GUI and then port that GUI over into Python code and then merge our code into it. So we have two. GUI version projects that start out as console code that we'll look at toward the end. Uh, so well, let's go ahead and get started. First of all, we need to talk a little bit about the resources and tools, and then the processes that are involved, I'll demo for you, and uh, we can walk through those. The tools are, uh, in this case, all free. Right? Python is famous for being public domain, well, almost public domain, open source and totally free and uh, so like python so are the ides that we'll use the tools that we'll use to create the GUIs. Now, python comes with uh, a uh, library of gui tools that can be used but they are kind of tedious and error prone time consuming you have to know python pretty well you also have to know your screen layout pretty well and understand pixel placements and so forth and know the measurements of the buttons that you want. Everything has to be coded in the dark by hand. And then you go and look and see if it worked out. And if it didn't, then you go back to your coding and tweak. It's much easier to work in a drag and drop style environment where you just say, I want a form or I want a window. The window pops up and you've got a, a long collection of objects. We call them widgets. Uh, and that we can just drag over, position them, stretch them the way we want, and create the GUI live, and then say, take a look at it and see. Let's view the form, see what it looks like. Uh, and uh, we get to, to see what it's actually going to look like when it runs. That has no Python code or any other kind of code uh, currently at that point. It's just the GUI. Most of these, these are WYSIWYG, uh, for those who are a little newer to computer science. Uh, WYSIWYG is a term that was formed back in the 80s when what you see is what you get was kind of new for applications, for, for anything. We used to see text-based everything. And uh, so WYSIWYG design is really nice because you can see exactly what the form is going to look like before you commit yourself. There are a lot of code-independent GUI creators uh, form creators, designers. Uh, what they generally do when I say they're code independent, they usually work in XML, sometimes HTML or JSON, but they'll use in some, they'll work in some kind of a text-based uh, portable format that the applications 
that would need that code can understand easily, such as the porting executables that we use to convert between the XML and Python, or actually in, in the tools we're using between XML and C++ if you want. So what we're going to use this week is we've got, or this today, uh, we've got Python 3.9.6. Uh, that was current as of the development of the webinar when I, when I put this together. Uh, there's a 3.9.7, and then 3.10 just came out, but it's a little bit flaky, so I would, uh, uh, you can play with it if you want, but don't depend on it yet. The uh, PyCharm is the tool we'll use, the IDE we'll use, to develop our uh, scripts. So that's what I use. Uh, there are lots of other ones out there. VS Code is popular. Visual Studio has VS Code built into it. Spider, Eclipse. Eclipse is a Java development environment, but you can add the PyDev plugin and then develop your Python there. Also PyScriptor and even Idle. And Idle is a little different from the others in that it, it is packaged with Python. So when you install Python, you've got an editor. It's just kind of the bottom of the barrel sort of editor. It doesn't have anything fancy about it at all. It's color coding and number, line numbering. Other than that, it's basically like Notepad. And in fact, it doesn't really make any difference what you use to write your Python code. You can write it in Notepad if you're, if you're proficient enough to do so. You just have to make sure that it runs correctly under all circumstances. Then, once you've tested that out, then you can go to a GUI developer, something like Qt Designer. That's what we use here. That's pronounced Qt in the Python world. You'll hear Qt in the uh, C++ world, for instance. But uh, PyQt 5 is the library that we use to uh, give us the, and you can use PyQt 5 without having the designer if you want to code by hand. That's tedious and ugly. Qt Designer gives you the WYSIWYG uh, for creating the form as you are looking at it uh, without having to speculate as to what the position on the screen might be for your buttons or how many pixels wide they need to be, things like that. Now there's also included with Python, just like Idle is, there is a, uh, a product from Active State. It's called TK Interface or TK Enter for short. Some people pronounce it T Kinter and some say Tinker for some reason. I have no idea why, but it's TK Enter officially. And uh, that requires that the GUI code be written by hand. And so, you know, all the geometry of the buttons and the uh, forms, the placement on the screen, the placement of the buttons on the forms. Uh, relative to top and left and so forth, the width, the fonts, everything has to be done by hand without seeing it. And then you execute it and see if what you what you hope for is what you got. I usually don't. Uh, when I execute mine, my buttons are off in space someplace. So uh, the advantage, the only real advantage to TK Enter is that it's fairly lean. You can write one line of code and put a bunch of configurations on that one line Whereas uh, PyQt will require several different lines, but really that's, uh, it's more, a little bit more intuitive, even if you're coding by hand. The uh, benefits of using the GUI design tools are rapid development, mostly, right? Uh, the what you see is what you get. You can create those GUIs so much faster than you can by trial and error and you know doing everything but getting a ruler out and measuring your screen to see where to put things. Pi, or uh, Qt Designer is included in the Qt Creator suite, which has all sorts of other development tools. Uh, the uh, Qt Designer though is free, as is WX Python and PySide, and there's several others. If you just Google GUIs for Python, you'll find a lot of the development tools. So, once you create the GUI that you want, you save that GUI. And Designer sa saves the GUI. We mentioned earlier, some use HTML, some use uh, JSON, some use XML. Well, XML 
has been around a long time and most applications understand XML. So it's a little bit more portable between applications than others. So these UI files that get created, the user interface files, are in XML format. Then you have to translate them, aka port them, to be used in uh, C++ or Python. That's what Qt Designer happens to be. So whatever your language is, you have to have some kind of a porting tool to do that. So we have one. And uh, so we'll port, when we port Qt, it ends up in Qt code, which in our case is PyQt5, right? And it ends up saved as a traditional uh, Python module in, P, in a PY extension, right? Then we can edit the thing in PyCharm or whatever we happen to use. Now, if you're working in a really big, sophisticated project, it's way, way, way easier to write the GUI, to create the GUI, but it's also considerably more voluminous, right, for lack of a better word. It's, it's huge code, the, the file. In fact, one of the things we'll look at, we'll have nearly a thousand lines of cute, PyQt code that's created for us. Fortunately, we didn't have to write it. We just create the GUI and say save, and it's done for us. So it's effortless to create. That makes rapid deployment a little bit uh, more reasonable. Now, that, the thing is, a QT designer, a QT designer doesn't give us anything as far as functionality. It just gives us the GUI. So the only way you have any functionality is if your functionality strictly involves the GUI. I mean, you can say, change this color on the GUI when I click this button. You can take care of those sorts of things in QT designer if you want, but not processing, not connecting to databases or processing running functions and so forth. Technically, you could, but it would be really, really cumbersome to do. So, the Python code, back to the actual software that we've written, the Python code that was originally written for the console can be ported or merged with the new GUI Python file that was created to create a GUI version of the same app. When you do that, there's a little bit of manual porting, so to speak, some manual tweaks that you'll have to make. They're pretty standard, so they can almost be automated. But uh, there are also certain locations you have to put your code into, typically uh, within or below the main functions within the class that gets created for the GUI but not always. Uh, variables, things like that, might fall outside of that class. It just depends. During the development, what I suggest is some things won't, you just can't leave in there, like input statements, because input statements pause the execution of the code until the input uh, is supplied and interspressed. We don't want that in the GUI. So, the first thing we need to do is probably move the import or the uh, input code to be uh, supplied in fields in our GUI. Then we can get rid of all the inputs. You can leave the uh, print statements because until we tell them not to, the uh, GUI will run and the console will run at the same time. So as we interact with the GUI, the console output will still be printed and we can use it as a, a point of reference in comparison to make sure that, that everything that we said to do when you click a button is doing what we wanted it to do, outputting the correct thing. Because we know that our REPL application was fully functional to begin with, right? So here are our steps. Step one, we need some something to write our Python code in. So we've written a REPL app, and in this case, we've used PyCharm to write that REPL app, customer info. When we run it to test it, the output comes out down here, and this would be the same if you were running VS Code or Spider or whatever. They've all got output panes. So uh, you see the results. 
And what you see here may or may not accurately reflect what you would see in the real REPL. So things like clearing screens and doing certain types of spacing and, uh, and uh, margins, you know, uh, formatting of tables, things like that, sometimes don't look the way they intend, uh, you intended them to be looked, uh, to be looked, to be looking or to look. Uh, so we need to execute the uh, REPL code in the REPL to make sure that it actually functions as intended and throw everything in the world at it to make sure that it's, you've handled all the errors and that everything is going to work correctly. Once you've done that, you're fully satisfied that you've got a good Python console app that does just exactly what you want. In this case, query a database uh, for Fred and hands you back the contact information that was supplied by the database. Once you're, and then wait for you to press enter to loop and do it again. Right, REPL, by the way, stands for read. That is, you're going, the Python is going to read your input and then evaluate it, do whatever you've told it to do, and then print it to the screen, and then loop around and wait for you to move to the next item. So that's what that is, is, is read, evaluate, print, and loop. We, can't, we typically call the console in Python the REPL. So then, we, uh, open something like Cube Designer, and uh, we design our code based on what we see in the console when we run our app. So we need a place to put in the user's name. We probably need to tell the uh, user of our product what that field is for. Same thing here for customer information that we probably need to supply back. So we need room to put things. We need a button. We used to type it in and press enter. Now we need a button. Uh, maybe we'd like to make the uh, this uh, line edit, it's called. Maybe we'd like to make it understand when we press enter after we type something in, then it needs to automatically click that button for us. Right? So we can we can decorate it however we want, put the titles on it, we can give it icons, whatever we'd like to do. And it's so easy because you can just grab what you want. You A label, you want it right here, put it there. And then you can stretch it to whatever size you want, double click it and type whatever content you want it to have, grab a push button, bring it over here, drop it someplace, double click it, give it a title, uh, resize it, stretch it. So what you see is what you're going to get when you come up here to form and say view form. And it will produce it for you with no background coding functionality, but you'll see exactly what the GUI is going to look like. Step four then is to convert what we just did. And uh, we do that with a uh, little program called Pi. UIC, which is the Python user interface converter, and it creates it to PyQt code. And you'll notice that PyUIC5 is matched with PyQt5, which is the version we're using. There is a 6, but it has some limitations that I don't like. Uh, then you say, well, here's the output file. That's what the O is. This is what I want you to create. And here's the XML data. That's what the X is. Here's what I'm going to feed you, the UI file that was created by Cute Designer. Awesome. Then what we get, once we've created this, we look in it and we're going to see a line that says slots by name. That's the method being executed. Then we're going to see right below that that there's going to be a, a uh, function called retranslate UI. It's a user interface, right? So what we do is separate those to provide ourselves a little space. Everything above and below has been already created for us. We just need to merge the code from our two files. And the way we do that is to take our REPL code to begin with and paste it right here. So this comes from our REPL code. 
then we do things like remove the whiles and replace it with a function, uh, and then maybe add uh, button clicks and so forth. We remove our inputs and say read the lines from, from a field, maybe a line edit, then check those out, make our, send our query off, whatever the case may be. But we have to tweak the code a bit. Now we could, I've taken it out here, but we could leave the print lines in there because when you execute this up here, you'll see the GUI and you'll also see down at the bottom that same little uh, run pane that shows you the output and you can compare. I think I mentioned that just a few minutes ago. So once everything works exactly the way you want, then you're gonna end up having both of these sort of windows, I mean, not with this text in them, but you're gonna have your GUI running and you're gonna have your, uh, your uh, console running. And you don't want the console running every time you launch the GUI. So to solve that problem, we just rename our Pi extension. We left it Pi because we wanted to see the console while we were doing the developing. Now we change it to Pi W, that Python for Windows, and poof, the uh, console is gone. The REPL is gone from the background. Then if we like it and we, you know, no matter how complicated, how complex it might be, we can create a packaged executable with all of its entourage of files that it needs in one folder, or we can correct, uh, create a standalone, all-inclusive executable with Pi Installer just by saying that, that minus F means one file. So we say, Pi Installer, give me a file, an executable file out of myapp.py and it'll create a myapp.exe. And then you can stick it on a USB stick and give it to your colleagues to, uh, or your users to run. Works pretty nicely. Let's take a look here at the two projects that I mentioned. Uh, we've seen one of them in the, uh, in the examples, in the slides so far. Uh, that was this little uh, simple customer database app. Then there's also a uh, kind of a challenging, I can't complete it, uh, a challenging number puzzle with multiple levels if you succeed and so forth, uh, and a lot of other options. And I created that to demonstrate that it doesn't have to look like a Windows app. You can give your app personality that goes beyond Windows. And you can write these apps to use uh, on Linux or something if you wanted to, right? In on Unix, Linux, any of the varieties. Uh, so uh, what we've got is these two apps were pre-written for console execution. They run appropriately in the console. Then each one's gonna become a GUI app. What we're gonna do is take a look at the finished interfaces and then we'll see how we got there, right? So this is the database app we'll look at where we just saw this a little bit ago. So where we type in Fred and we get back Fred's contact information from the database along with uh, most commonly purchased categories, uh, in this case, camping and boating equipment, we would assume it's a sporting goods store maybe, right? Or some big box store. Then we've got the game I mentioned, and this is based on the legend of the Temple of Hanoi. And I just kind of twisted it a little bit and said, well, let's work with a, let's build a, uh, a GUI app that uses almost exclusively text, just so you can get an idea of what you can do with text and fonts. So what you see up here there are actually only six items on the screen that are not text-based. And those are these five buttons and this uh, image. Everything else that you see, actually this one up here is the icon, so seven. That's the icon for the app itself. A little shuffle numbering. Uh, all the rest, everything else you see on here is just text. 
with specialized fonts and so forth. All right, so uh, let's go ahead and take a look at these. We'll look at the database app and see how it works, what its functionality is. It performs little SQL queries to give us back our information. We're using uh, SQLite 3, uh, which comes with Python free. SQLite 3 is the number one uh, used world's most popular database. I bet you didn't know that, but it is. Why? Because it's on every cell phone, pretty much on planet Earth, every smartphone, your contacts, and so forth, are stored in SQLite 3 databases because it's so light and it's local. So we have a good uh, opportunity to build localized applications. We can also do regular SQL. I didn't want to build a SQL server for this 30 minute or 45 minute demo. So uh, then we'll have this little number puzzle with the multiple levels and uh, pop-up windows. Actually, both of them have pop-ups. So let's go ahead. We're going to start with the REPL, then we'll look at the GUI development, and then we'll take a look at the, at the porting of the Python code merging into that GUI source code. And if we have time, don't know if we will or not, if we have time, I'll uh, pop up another uh, GUI or two to show you from real life projects that uh, I've done over the years. So let's take a look before we sum up. Let's take a look if I can. I must have hit the wrong button. There we go. Sorry. And see what we've got here. Here we go. This is, uh, I'm going to minimize this. This is actually PyCharm we'll look at in a minute. Here are the two applications. This is our customer info app that we saw in the slides. And I can put in Fred, and there's our answer back, right? I can put in something, any part of the name, H-A-R. And if it's ambiguous, I'll get all the results back. So this one brought back two customers whose names have H-A-R in them. That's pretty straightforward. It's doing SQL queries in the background to grab that. Then here's my little uh, uh, Rose of Hanoi puzzle game, which is just a matter, uh, it's shuffling game, right? Uh, move it down one or move it down two lines. The idea is to, to move everything to some other line and keep them in numeric order with the smallest always being to the right. The puzzle won't let you do something else. So this is a relatively, uh, once you get the hang of it, relatively easy to solve uh, puzzle, but you got to do a little bit of number shuffling. And then when you get to the end and you complete that level, you start out with three numbers, now it takes us to four, and that's level two. You can increase the difficulty or you can decrease the difficulty. You can see the story, the legend, the modified legend. We made it rows of numbers. Did some other little tweaks. Uh, you could also, if you've done something you wish you hadn't done, uh, maybe, and you say, oh, I shouldn't have done that. Let me start over again. Then restart the level, right? And uh, you can also increase your and decrease your difficulty. Uh, you can't take it below two because it wouldn't make any sense. So you're told over here, there's no lower level. And you can also increase your difficulty all the way up to eight. I can't get there. I can get through six. I can't get past seven. My grandson, who's a math geek in college, he can get through seven, but he can't get through eight. So, you know, knock yourselves out. That's just an example, though. What you see here looks nothing like a Windows app, aside from the title bar, which technically we could remove if we wanted. We could float it up there with no title bar at all. And you see the little numbers icon here that we talked about. Uh, and the tower here. All right, let's take a look and see how all this was built. This is PyCharm, for those of you who don't know it, and uh, we'll just double click on the uh, REPL version of the customer app first, and you see that we've got some things instantly you'll notice we're not going to need in a graphical user interface. We don't need to ask for anything. We don't need to prompt the user for input. So you know that the input, any input statements, are going to get, need to get removed just to get the app to function correctly as a GUI, right? So, because otherwise it'll just halt when it gets to those. So the first thing we might do then is take this 
and place it as an instruction somewhere on our form, right? And then uh, simply take whatever the line was that the user was supposed to type in on and put that into search. So some little tweaks we make like that, uh, knowing that we're not going to be able to prompt the user. It'll, it'll just be a static prompt. It will just stay there on the screen. We also won't need this while loop that keeps the program on the screen, the menus on the screen and so forth, because the GUI stays on the screen, right? Uh, so our inputs go and our while loop gets replaced probably with a function in most cases that runs the rest of the code that you see here. The prints can be left in there until we are absolutely sure the GUI is working correctly and then we can comment out the prints and finally just remove the prints if we want. So let's take a look at the UI. So we know how this works. Let me go ahead and run it just so you'll see it. Uh, if up, there we go. And we see down at the bottom, remember we can't do everything here. I mentioned that. Uh, so for instance, we can't clear a screen. Uh, so the screen's not gonna clear properly. That's why we tested in the REPL after we tested here. This is the basic functionality we need to make sure works. So let's use our friend Fred since I've already run him. There's Fred Smith. There's our information. We press enter. It should clear the screen. We get a, a funky little character on the screen instead. And But if we put H-A-R, uh, then we get R2. So we've tested it. We know it works here. The queries work. But uh, we need to quit this. We need to go run this in the uh, actual native environment where users would run it. Right? So users would normally double click on an application. So let's double click on it. It runs in the REPL. Does it still work as expected? Yes, it does. And now when we press enter, the screen's cleared. It takes us right back. Uh, and we can do our multiple, uh, multiple queries or whatever. And in fact, if we just press enter, it shows us all of our five customers. Big business, huh? So we know that this app works. We just need to put a GUI on it now. So let's take a look at what that would involve. This is Cute Designer. When you first open it up, it says, what do you want? A dialogue or a window or a widget box? What do you want? And you pick what you want. This is just a simple dialogue. Uh, you can build full applications out of dialogues if you want. So over on the left-hand side, you see the widgets. This is the widget box. It's got everything imaginable. So if you wanted to put something on uh, the screen that wasn't there, notice these are resizable. You can double click and edit the texts and so forth. Everything is there. If you want to see what it looks like, you can come up to form and say preview. And this is what it's actually going to look like when it runs on your computer. That will change based on the theme you have on your computer, but you get an idea of what it's going to look like. The, the interface by default is shown in Windows 7 interface, but you see here what it's going to look like in Windows 10, for instance. But we could just grab some widget. Let's take a tree widget. I'll drag that over here and show you. I'll just put it here temporarily. You can build everything right here as far as GUI interaction goes. So we say, I'd like to have something in this widget. I'm going to have a hierarchy. This is going to be a tree. And I'll say animals. And uh, then I'll have another one that is maybe vegetables. And then I'll go back to animals and give it a sub category here, sub item. And I'll say this is uh, canine. Canines. And then I'll do the same thing here under vegetables. Maybe if I could think of, of a certain type of vegetable, uh, which I can't right now, a category of vegetable, uh, citrus. All right, so yeah, I could do that right here and say, that's actually fruit, isn't it? All right, never mind the categories. The idea is here, now that if I create this, I should have saved it, if I create this and give it subcategories, uh, and even give them some categories. 
then when I say OK, I see my table here. If you expand everything, this is what it's going to look like, not my table, but my hierarchy. If I, if I expand it, this is what it's going to look like. But I'd like to see the real thing. What's it going to work like? So, whoops. I'll come back and look at that in just a second. Uh, let's look here at uh, our form and preview. And we see what it's going to look like when a user runs it. This is our hierarchy, but you see how it expands. And we can select things. So it expands and collapses just like we would want it to. We could have hundreds of things in here. A scroll bar will appear if it's necessary. Then if we want to change things like the fonts and so forth, you know, that's not bold enough. Then we can come back over here, click on the item, and come over to the side. Notice as soon as we click it, it appears over here, it gets selected. And we can scroll down, change geometry, all sorts of other things. But one of the things we can do is change the font. So I could say, let's make it bold. And notice that it changes over here. Once I'm satisfied with this, I just save it as a UI file. I'm not going to save this. Uh, but I'll show you what happens when we then use our Pi UIC to port it to Python code. And I'm going to, whoops, nah, get out of here, Mike. Keep the white one. There we go. So this has got 79 lines of code minus the blank lines here and there. So roughly maybe 70 lines of code. The only thing that we put in here, that I put in here, was this little block. That's the entire remainder of our REPL code. That's it. Remember I said we start with our slots by name? Make a little space between it and the retranslate? That's where you paste your code. The only time you'd need to paste anything anywhere else would be perhaps up at the top we needed to have SQL or SQLite. So uh, we did that, did that import. But everything else up there, all the other imports and so forth, were done. Then we needed a connection to our database. So we needed to put that code in. Uh, but everything else is done inside the class. All the rest of the code is written for us. It's a little bit more impressive when we look at the uh, Hanoi app. This is the REPL version. And I'm going to move down to the end just to show you the REPL version had uh, about 100 lines of code minus a few blank lines and a few comments here and there. So there wasn't a great deal of, uh, and, and there's also some text here that's going to be spat out to the screen if you want to know the legend. Not a whole lot otherwise, except outside of the program, before we do anything else, we have some imports, and we have our variables all set up. Right? Quite a few functions here, but nothing to compare with what we'll have in the GUI version. Why? Because we can use ifs and else ifs and elses to tell whether what the entry was in a menu. Right? And I'll show you that menu. This little guy is, is kind of interesting to to run, there's the menu, and we make a choice. Let's say one, and uh, that's going to move A to B, and then two is going to move A to C, moves the last number, right? And if we try to do something we can't, notice it says we have two tries. If we try to do something that won't work, like one again, it says invalid, move, try again. And it doesn't increment our tries, right? Uh, so this is the, the console version of it. And if we ran it in its expected environment, then we would just be working at the console and everything would refresh and the screen would automatically clear. And all of this would happen uh, pretty much transparently as we moved items around from column to column or from row to row up at the top. So we've proven that that works. Now, the first thing I did was create a simple GUI on a form so that I could check the code and create the functions necessary to do the things that I wanted my buttons on the final uh, GUI to do. That way I could just test them in a simple environment 
and make sure everything was going to work. That allowed me to cut and paste a lot of code as long as I named the objects and uh, and their uh, values the same for both of them. So once I did that, then I went ahead and uh, took a look at a uh, more complex GUI. And you, you, you kind of learn what to expect as you use this. Remember when I told you it's all text-based? There are actually hidden buttons. They're invisible back here. But everything that you see is text. Those are just the labels on the buttons. How about that? All of these numbers that will get shuffled around, those are that's just a special font. That's all it is. There's my numbers. See there? Just using a special font called game font. All right. um, now, if I look over here on the uh, left-hand side, let's view this uh, form to see what it's going to look like. And it's still going to show all the numbers there because that's what I pre-populated. So uh, let's say preview, and there it is. All that's going to be cleared out where it doesn't need to be by my Python code, right? So then let's see what code was involved in generating that preview that we just saw. Because that's this uses C++ to generate the previews. And this is what I popped up a while ago, but I wanted to really show you this one instead. This is a good deal of code to produce this non-traditional Windows GUI interface. That's a lot of code that we would have had to write by hand, pretty much in the dark, and then test it to see if it got placed right and if it looked right. If you want it, if you're running C++, then you can just say select all, and you can uh, press Control C and then go paste it into your source code for C++. It's ready to go. When we save it, we don't have that option. It saves as XML. So this, got, this has been saved just like the other one was in uh, as a UI file in XML format. So let's take a look at what happens then, what code we get. And I'm going to move again to the bottom just so you can see here. Whoops, this is the simple GUI. Let's go to the complex one. Look at this, 989 lines of code. Remember I told you, this, is, this probably produced 900 lines of code for us. We didn't have to do anything. Much. We had to do the porting. Now, when it comes to the porting, we had to do a little bit more here. This game has sound. This game uses the operating system to clear the screens and so forth. This game uses random integers. So we had to do some other imports. Anything that says PyCute on it was imported automatically. We had to have some, some uh, variables and lists populated. Right? Uh, so we did that in advance. But here, this is where the GUI definitions start. That's where on line 18 here, from there down, it's all converted XML to create this code. And this is some this is some volume of code here. I don't think you would want to do all of that, especially the palettes and the colors. Notice all the, the, the uh, here's our rectangle. This is our geometry for a rectangle. And this is our brush colors that we're going to use for that rectangle. So there are all sorts of things that are uh, created for us. Man alive, look how, but we're down into the 600s, right? And what are we looking for? We're looking for slots by name. And of course, we could really search for it. You know, like we could just do a control F and type in slots by name and it would take us straight to it. But what I want to point out to you that this thing wrote nearly 750 lines just for the GUI itself, and there's more to come. So our code starts here at uh, line 759, basically at line 760. But we had a lot more tweaking to do. We had functions to write because we're not looking at, at one 
text input anymore. We're having to see what was clicked and run a different function to pay, depending on what, I, what button was clicked and look at the circumstances and so forth. So this actually required uh, several hours of, of tweaking to turn it into a GUI. But this is a pretty unusual uh, sort of project that you wouldn't do in a business. But if we go down all the way to 944, there's our retranslate. Everything in there in between those two points, I wrote. All the rest of this code, now I may have tweaked a few things, but everything else in this code was put there for me automatically when I translated that XML. Isn't that awesome? That's just, to me, that's just awesome. All right, and then one last thing I'm going to show you. We, I ran over last time uh, I did this, and I'm not going to run over again. Uh, I've got about a minute left, so I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time showing you uh, this, the code or anything here. This is a real project, a database project for a company that, uh, that I did a couple of years ago, actually, three years ago. And uh, let me show you what it looks like when I run it. And you'll notice it has a slight shading. The customer picked the color, kind of a light green. Uh, but this one actually uh, runs stuff, does stuff. So I can say John as the first name. And it gives me John. And I can modify John and say, here's his bid date. Uh, and then, whoops, it didn't allow me to put that bid date in. Oh, too old, maybe. I don't remember the project exactly. 03-21-2021. Uh, now let's try that. Yep, and you notice it updates the record and it tells me the approval's pending. If I take the bid date back out, that goes away when I save the project. Pending will go away. Can't be pending if you haven't even made a bid. And I can click map. And remember, this was John Lane at 3963 Gasper Drive in Dallas, Texas. That house right there, there's his driveway right there. And we have the map. So you can integrate this with other apps and technologies as well. I liked that, and I hope that you guys enjoyed it as well. So what we've done, I hope, if we got through all this, was uh, to take a look at the basics of putting a GUI onto a Python project, specifically an extant project, one that we've already written that's working, uh, and how to port that GUI over into Python, how to insert our existing code, and how simple it can be in some cases, and how very complicated it can be in other cases. But in the end, you still have a GUI on your Python project. So uh, with that, I believe we, uh, I'll turn this back over to uh, the ladies in charge. <laughs> Thanks so much, Mike. We appreciate it. Um, I did have some questions during the presentation, um, but for the folks who haven't asked their questions yet, please do so. Um, in the meantime, I am going to steal the stage for just a moment. Uh, for those of you that have already participated in webinars or classes through Learning Tree, you will be able to access this webinar on your My Learning Tree account. Uh, for anyone who is new to Learning Tree, you also have a My Learning Tree account just by registering for this webinar. So in the next few days, you will receive a follow-up email with details on how to activate your account and get access to this and other webinars, as well as great assets, such as skills assessments and access to our e-catalog. Um, okay, Mike, let me look here because the questions came through my private chat here. Um, oh, while well, I'm searching, Dan just asked, can we get a copy of the presentation? Dan, yes, uh, you'll get an email from us here with my learning tree information to log in and, and get that presentation as well. Okay, so um, somebody has asked, is it possible to write a whole app in Qt Designer alone without any other programming language? Only if your app doesn't need the programming language. Uh, the only real example I could possibly give you of that would be to show you 
in my designer repository, which I put here just for that sort of purpose, something I call a crib toy because it's just creating signals and slots and you can make a change here and actually change, affect what you see on this GUI. And I'll show you that real briefly. So you see it says 50% cat, and you see the bar here is 50%, the progress bar. I can change it to 75% duck or 100% horse, whatever. Uh, so if you've got a, uh, you, you want to have a crib toy for your kid to entertain himself with, then, you know, toggle the text off and on, make things blink. You can do those sorts of things, but not if you're going to do anything productive at all. You can make your GUIs do some fancy stuff, but you're still going to need to write the uh, program somewhere else. The GUI is independent. All right. Thank you for I that. that and then um, I hope so. Um, somebody had said, I already have some C++ console apps. Can I create a GUI template for Python apps with Qt Designer and use it on my C++ apps as well? Absolutely, absolutely. You remember when I showed you the uh, forms, and we'll just look at this one for example, uh, when I said view code, this is C++ code for that form. So it makes it very easy to drop this into your source file for C++ and use it directly without even having to port it from, uh, from XML. Uh, the other thing that you can do is create, and I know this GUI wouldn't be the one, but create a GUI that is, uh, is going to be maybe company-wide, so all your software has the same design with the same icons, the same colors, the same basic interface, uh, whether you're looking something, looking up an employee's address or a customer's address or uh, maybe sales history for, for uh, somebody or uh, looking up some person's uh, missing order. All of your uh, apps could have the same look and feel with the corporate logo on them and the corporate colors. So yes, absolute, absolutely. In Cute Designer, natively, with no extra stuff, you can do C++ and Python, and you can use C++ and Python inserted into other languages that support the embedded of not, embedding of non-native code. I, you could use C++ okay. back in the Pascal days. <laughs> well, um, Ellen asked a question in the chat uh, saying, can we link it to a specific website? And I think that was in reference to the first question that was asked about writing a whole app in Qt Designer alone. So I think that's what that was in reference to. So is it possible to link that app to right. a specific website? Sure. Let me close this little guy out here. Uh, yeah, you can put apps. I don't know if you're talking about writing the website so that it includes the app or writing the app so that it includes the website or accesses it. But just like you saw here with the uh, uh, extra one, let me see if I can launch that little guy again, the one that I actually wrote for somebody. Uh, this guy, let me see, it'll run again. That's what this guy does. So if I put in some address, I'll use John again, mainly because I have his permission to. Uh, he's a real person. It's a real address. Uh, anyway, yeah, so what we've done here, this map button, just really just launches that URL in Google Maps. And so, yeah, you can have the buttons do something that isn't productivity required. Uh, you know, this is just opening up something that already exists. Somebody else wrote the software. So certainly you can link it to a URL. Uh, you can even link graphics to URLs so that when you click the graphic, it'll take you straight to your company's website, All right? Uh, so yeah, absolutely, That's great question. Yeah, that's perfect. Um, and then this question came in, which is kind of a, 
a shameless plug for one of my classes. But um, if I want to learn Python, but I'm new to programming, uh, where should I start? Ah, am I allowed to switch <laughs> to the next screen, Darby? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So if uh, we switch back here, there you go. And the answer to the question is, where do you go? If you're not a programmer, then you want to go to 1904, probably. That's for non-programmers. We use Eclipse in that course with the Python plugin and uh, PyDev plugin to do Python development. That's two days. It generally is a Monday and a Tuesday, followed by three days of 1905, which is the actual Python training that expects maybe that you have a little bit of understanding of programming, uh, not a whole lot. Uh, people have taken many times, hundreds of times, 1905 without 1904. But they, uh, depending on your experience level and where you're com comfortable, uh, you could spend the whole week or you could just spend the latter three days. Uh, you could, some people just do the first two days, either way. These are, those are both great classes and that's a good place to get your start. I hope that answered the question. Yeah, and that was our, our last question. So if anybody else has any questions, feel free to chat them. But in the meantime, Mike, if you want to go over uh, the other courses, would 1906 be a good follow on then to the 1905? Well, you know, I would love to because of its numbers. I would love to say yes, <laughs> but actually 1906, it's like there's no intermediate, right? Uh, you go straight from foundation to advanced. That expects you to have a lot of Python or at least other programming experience in your background. Uh, we do in there unit testing, best practices, design patterns. This is really advanced stuff for somebody who's just getting started. It's probably more advisable uh, to take something like Introduction to Python for Data Analytic, Analytics first, that's a one day, that's foundational, and then Applied Data Science with Python and Jupyter. Jupyter is another interface that's used for engineering and data science. Uh, it's mm -hmm. you, instead of PyCharm, you don't develop applications there, you analyze data there normally. And uh, you build uh, Jupyter workbooks, so you learn another tool, and you also learn a uh, another science. So I would say at least take those two uh, before you take the 1906. The 1906 is great, though. Uh, it's a super class. It's four days. But, you know, it's a brain drain if you're not really comfortable <laughs> with those topics. Well, I know uh, just from my own experience, Python's huge right now. So um, I know those are some of our top courses, especially in the data science and programming range. Um, that is all the questions we had. I am I appreciate it to the folks that are answering the polls um, that we have listed. I did notice blockchain. We do have a couple courses in blockchain. So please visit our website, uh, learningtree.com, uh, and you can find some more information on, I believe it's a one day and then a two day uh, blockchain training class. Um, and we do have some data analytics training as well. So definitely visit our website. And if you have any questions uh, for us regarding um, GUIs and Python or any other areas, you can certainly give us a ring directly um, or post a question online. We're happy to help you whenever we can. And, and so thank sure you so let, much, Mike. And uh -huh. Be sure and let uh, Darby and Beth or Learning Tree in general know if you would like to see uh, like a full course on GUIs or on maybe Django, which is the development platform with Python to build websites or something else related to Python that you're interested in because our uh, Python core courses are really growing. I mean, Python right now is the number mm -hmm. one developer language to know uh, the most jobs out there and the highest paying currently. Just a tip from Uncle Mikey. <laughs> Thanks so much, Mike. Thanks so much, everyone, for joining. I hope everyone has a great afternoon, and we'll chat uh, hopefully and see you soon in a webinar or a class. Thank you.